Um, good morning. Uh, it's really an honor for me to be here among so many trailblazers and people of just uh, extraordinary courage. Um, and it's an honor for me to, to give a talk. Um, I'm going to try to leave some time for questions, but uh, frankly, there probably won't be. But uh, during the break, you're welcome to approach me and ask anything you want. Um, and introduce yourself if you haven't done so yet. Um, I'm going to be talking about institutional capture um, uh, and sp focusing on uh, two areas in particular, uh, education and medicine. What am I missing here? Ah, there we go. Okay, so the question I want to try to answer um, is how have, with apologies to Winston Churchill, how have so few managed to achieve so much in so little time? Um, how is it that a tiny minority of people have managed to promote um, a theory of the human person that is uh, extreme, socially destabilizing, at odds with science and common sense, and get that theory institutionalized across uh, all walks of American and actually Western societies um, within what seems like a heartbeat? Um, you know, we can think uh, about other civil rights causes, um, you know, black civil rights, hundreds of years in the making, arguably not done yet. Women's rights, hundreds of years in the making, arguably not done yet. Gay rights, uh, at least 50 years in the making, arguably not done yet. Um, trans rights, a decade, extraordinarily, extraordinarily successful. Why? And my thesis is that a big part of the story has to do with American exceptionalism and the civil rights state. And by exceptionalism, I'm not using that term in the normative sense, although I do think that America is an exceptional country. I'm using that term in the descriptive sense, and I'm gonna be talking about the unique features of the American political system and political culture. And I'm gonna be trying to show how those features help explain a lot of what we're seeing nowadays. I know, I know, there are competing explanations. I know that for some people, this is all about following the money, and for some, this is just Judith Butler institutionalized. Um, I'm not here to deny that these two alternative theories are important, that they have a lot to tell us. I do think that they have a lot of truth behind them. Um, but I think what I'm about to talk about is uh, at least as important and often gets ignored. So as I said, I'm going to be talking about two areas of policy, K-12 education and healthcare. Obviously, one could talk about the institutional capture of media. We heard about the New York Times, you know, the famous Glad trucks. Um, we could talk about the medical journals, the scientific establishment, and so on and so forth. But I want to focus on these two. So starting with K-12 education, um, it's really important to understand a concept that Wesley Yang mentioned and I want to talk more about, and that is the American civil rights state. Um, we, when we think about civil rights, we tend to associate that term with, you know, the March and Selma, um, the famous Supreme Court decisions, lead, leading among them, of course, Brown versus Board of Education, um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But it's important to understand that Brown and other major court rulings were vague. Um, the Supreme Court did not really explain what it meant by, uh, you know, with all deliberate speed, uh, desegregate. Um, and so in the wake of that revolution, you have federal and state legislatures passing numerous civil rights statutes um, and creating bureaucracies, including the Federal Office for Civil Rights and the Department of Education, which I'm going to be talking about, to enforce those laws and those court rulings. Um, the civil rights state just doesn't matter of definition, um, and I'm taking this definition from uh, my mentor, uh, my dissertation advisor, who wrote a, a really phenomenal book on, on Title IX, um, refers to, quote, the extensive set of statutes, court decisions, and administrative regulations, guidelines, interpretations, and settlement agreements designed to prevent and rectify discrimination on a, uh, a wide range and growing number of uh, of, of causes, right? Well, race, sex, sexual orientation, and so on and so forth. And um, when you start looking at the civil rights state so defined, instead of just at individual court rulings, what you find uh, instantly is that there's just enormous complexity. Um, because you're talking about federal and state civil rights laws and divisions and, and, and agencies. Um, and you're talking about thousands upon thousands of uh, interpretive memos and guidelines, um, uh, and, and it's just, it's dizzying. Um, for example, uh, how many of you here know that Title IX relates to athletics? 
How many of you here have ever heard of the three-pronged test? That's good, that's good. So like five or six of you. Um, that's a good example of how the complexity of regulation, you know, the devil is in those details. And the vast majority of Americans are not paying attention to that stuff. But that's really where the action happens. Um, and complexity is not an unfortunate byproduct of civil rights regulation. It often is civil rights regulation. Because the more complex the regulation, the harder it is for the general public to understand what's going on, uh, to scrutinize the procedures and the policies being made, and the easier it is for uh, usually Democrats, because Democrats are the ones who uh, tend to expand the reach of the civil rights state, to uh, conceal unpopular political and policy choices from the public. Um, so very briefly, kind of a, an overview of, of transgender regulation in schools under Title IX. Um, in 2010, the Obama White House convened an anti-bullying initiative, uh, a summit at the White House, um, and shortly thereafter, the Office for Civil Rights and the Department of Education defined bullying as a form of sex-based harassment. Um, a year later, we get uh, an administrative guidance document called a Dear Colleague Letter. This was uh, issued unilaterally by the Office for Civil Rights with no input, no procedure, no process. Um, uh, where the uh, OCR defined uh, sexual harassment to include harassment based on gender identity. In the, uh, in the next three years, OCR received a number of complaints from students uh, in particular schools, especially in California and Illinois, um, where they claimed things like, you know, I'm transgender and um, uh, I've been harassed and bullied at school and my school's not doing enough to, to address it. And so OCR launches these uh, expensive and embarrassing investigations, I mean expensive and embarrassing for the schools, um, and through a tactics that could best be described as uh, institutional bullying, um, forces the school to adopt policies that uh, depart from uh, Title IX requirements, from sometimes even constitutional requirements. Um, uh, and, and schools sign these consent decrees with OCR. In 2014, a school board in Gloucester County, Virginia, holds a hearing. And uh, the topic of the hearing was there was a, uh, a boy, a, a, I should say a, a girl at the school who identified as a boy, um, and she wanted to use the boys' room, and, um, and the, uh, uh, the school board uh, voted against it. And um, a local lawyer by the name of Emily Prince, who has the, I think, the Twitter handle of Sworn Knight of the Transsexual Empire, um, wrote a private letter to the Office for Civil Rights and the Department of Justice and said uh, basically to the Obama administration, um, you know, there's this ongoing controversy here in our town, what do you have to say about it? And by this point, OCR had not yet gotten into the issue of what really defines a person as male or female. Um, all of its previous guidelines was about harassment uh, this was the first time that the question of who really counts as a boy um, was put squarely on the table. And um, this lawyer wrote a letter to the Office for Civil Rights and promised to share their response with uh, her uh, allies at NPR, um, BuzzFeed, and Metro Weekly, which is a very well-known uh, Washington, D.C.-based LGBT uh, um, uh, media. Um, and of course, the, 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 you know, there was a subtle threat there, right? The Obama administration was trying to rebuild the Democratic coalition on a younger, more socially progressive basis, and this law, activist lawyer was basically saying, if you don't give me the answer that I want, I'm gonna embarrass you. Um, uh, and sure enough, a couple months, a couple weeks later, she gets a, a letter from a mid-level bureaucrat in the Department of Education Office for Civil Rights by the name of James Ferg Kadema, um, where he says, look, it's my understanding that generally when these controversies arise, schools have to accommodate students according to their gender identity. Um, at this point, there was already an ongoing lawsuit over this case, uh, spearheaded by the ACLU, and um, the bottom line is that the, it, it went up to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, and the Court of Appeals said, you know, we're not gonna interpret Title IX de novo, um, we're going to defer under some uh, arcane doctrine of administrative law to the Office for Civil Rights and specifically to this letter. That was the decision made in uh, Gigi versus Gloucester in the Fourth Circuit, and a year later, um, uh, the Office for Civil Rights 
writes another Dear Colleague letter on transgender students where it says, students must always accommodate students according to their gender identity. And it cites the Fourth Circuit. So in this way, you get the Office for Civil Rights issuing unilateral declarations on the basis of no law and no precedent, a federal court deferring to those documents, and then OCR deferring to the federal court saying this has been settled. Um, and a lot, of what enabled this to happen is institutional capture at the Office for Civil Rights. Um, and there's really three parameters that we have to think about when we think about institutional capture. One is incentives. Um, you basically have a collective action problem here, where you have trans advocacy organizations that are um, highly coordinated, highly motivated, um, attentive to policy in this particular area. And then you have a diffuse, inattentive public that doesn't know uh, what the heck is going on um, and is disorganized and, um, and is unable to, to mount kind of counter pressures on the agency. And of course is afraid of being called out as transphobic. Number two, you also have an agency culture that's conducive of the kind of policies that, um, you know, sworn knights of the transsexual empire lawyers want. Um, so you have Catherine Lehman, who was the head of OCR at the time, she was reappointed by, by Biden, um, and James Ford Kadema are both ACLU lawyers. Um, and so when the ACLU sends them a petition saying, tell us what the policy should be, you know, those are their friends. And they're going to be going back to work at the ACLU probably when they're done uh, at OCR, this kind of the re revolving door. And then finally, regulators' self-interest. As I mentioned earlier, the Obama administration had a goal of rebuilding the Democratic coalition. Um, it was called at the time the Coalition of the Ascendant. He launched in 2012 the re-election campaign of We Can't Wait, uh, meaning we can't wait for Congress to authorize these new interpretations of civil rights. Um, and so it was in uh, OCR and the Department of Education's own self-interest um, to appease the ACLU uh, despite what the school board had, had voted. And what results from this new regulatory framework is actually vague rules. Um, do schools, for example, have to defer to student self-identification in every scenario? It's not clear. If you look at Title IX, the rules, the regulations, the court rulings, it really isn't clear. Um, does a student need to have gender dysphoria diagnosis in order to be considered of the opposite sex? Not clear. Um, how can a school, for example, distinguish between students who are sincere in their gender identification versus students who are faking it for some nefarious purpose? No guidance on that. Um, what is the role of the parents? When, if ever, should parents be notified? No guidance on that. Um, and so what all of this creates together is an environment of legal uncertainty. And if you're an administrator, a school administrator, or uh, you know, an attorney for a school board, you hate uncertainty. That is the one thing you want to avoid because that means risk of lawsuits, risk of OCR investigations. You want to know the rules. And so a rational administrator in this type of environment and a school board in this type of environment will want to minimize their risk. And how do you do that? Well, one way to do it is to defer to the very organizations that will sue you or file civil rights complaints against you. And so guess what? We have this new regulatory apparatus that has taken root in the last decade and a half that I call regulation by proxy. And the result is a kind of quid pro quo between schools and activist groups. The school says to the ACLU and the uh, gay, lesbian, and, and straight education network and other organizations that are advancing uh, transgender um, interests, um, the school says to them, look, we'll let you come in, dictate our policies, uh, help us change our school culture according to what you want. In exchange, you don't file OCR complaints and you don't sue us in federal court. And that really is the situation that most school, public schools are in nowadays. And this is a kind of a racket. Um, I don't think it was consciously desi designed, by the way, I, but it is a racket nevertheless. Why is this a problem? Well, I mean, unlike Democrats who have to face voters every two to four years, um, the ACL, you know, who voted for the ACLU? Who voted for the leadership of Glisson? They're not accountable to anyone except for their donors, um, and they tend by their kind of, uh, you know, their, their, uh, their, their very nature, they tend to attract activists whose views on these issues are uh, wildly out of sync with those of the vast majority of Americans. And so this regulation by proxy means delegating regulatory responsibility to activist organizations that are unaccountable and by definition very extreme. And 
sure enough, activist organizations often go beyond what elected officials and government bureaucrats could ever hope to get away with. Um, so I want to show you just one example. So I, I gave you two examples here of these model policies. Uh, the one on the left is the ACLU and Human Rights Campaign, the National Education of uh, uh, National Education Association. That's the big uh, teachers unions. Um, uh, this is their. Uh, 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 guidebook for schools called Schools in Transition. On the right, we see GLSEN's model district policy on transgender and gender nonconforming students. Um, I want to give you an example of, of what this means in practice for schools. So if you want to just uh, pull up the, the file. And this is from Schools in Transition. Silence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead, pull it up. Nope. Okay, uh, if you could just go up all the way to the top of the document. Okay, so uh, scroll down a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more to the table of contents. Okay, so go down a little bit, and I want you to look at Appendix D. Appendix D, gender support and gender... Imagine telling the sexual revolutionaries of the 1960s that one day their revolutionary moral passions will culminate in an Appendix D. <laughs> if you could just uh, uh, click on that. And this is um, so that you have a gender support plan. And I just want you, want you to see how, how detailed this is. So just kind of scroll down gradually. This is the gender support plan. Just scroll down, yeah. More, more, more. It doesn't end. And then you have the gender transition plan, which is a different document, also four pages long, um, where everything is detailed, including when, how, and if to notify parents. Okay, so let's go back to the, to the presentation. So this is what I mean. OCR could probably never get away with doing this. But by delegating responsibility for making these policies to unaccountable advocacy organizations through this racket, they can absolutely, absolutely do that. Okay, so let me pivot now to healthcare. With the little time that I have left, I'll try to get this, through this quickly. Um, you know, we all know the European experience, right, uh, with, with uh, so-called gender-affirming care. Um, early 2000s, European clinics uh, start to adopt uh, pediatric, what I've been calling pediatric sex trait modification, uh, drugs and surgeries. Um, then we see a sharp and sudden increase in referrals, a new patient profile, uh, adolescent onset, uh, high comorbid uh, uh, psychiatric conditions. Um, in these countries, in some of these countries, you have complaints by patients and parents in Sweden and Norway that happened, um, and you also have in some of them concerns raised by gender clinicians in you know, Finland, UK, Denmark. Um, then you have a couple years of evidence reviews, systematic evidence reviews by independent uh, uh, evidence evaluation agencies. 2020 until today, uh, kind of ongoing change of medical guidelines. Um, and alongside a decline in the ratio of referrals to medicalization. So that's kind of the, in, in broad strokes, what we've been seeing in Europe. What enabled this change in course in medicine? Um, if you look at the payer side, uh, these are countries that have, you know, with the partial exception of the UK, they have nationalized health insurance um, that pays for these services. And when you have a country that has, you know, any country has limited resources, um, uh, government has a fiduciary duty to voters to fund, in this case, evidence-based medical practices. So there's kind of built-in incentives, built-in pressures to try to uh, uh, allocate scarce resources uh, to the best available, meaning most evidence-based uh, medicine. Um, on the provider side, uh, these countries have a high degree of bureaucratic centralization in healthcare in general, but also more particularly in, uh, in, in gender medicine. So Finland has gender medicine centralized by law to two gender clinics. In Sweden, it's uh, pretty much exclusively at the Karolinska Hospital. Denmark has a single centralized service in Copenhagen, uh, and the UK has the JID service. Um, 
when you have a centralized bureaucracy, a single entity making decisions, you have more hierarchical authority, you have a better ability to assert control from top to bottom, and that also means that you have more accountability. Because now there's an address. If things go wrong, you know who to point the finger to. And um, th the European healthcare bureaucracies appear to be less vulnerable to non-scientific regulators. For example, the courts. Of course, the UK had that, you know, the, the, the Kira Bell case, and that was very influential. Um, but by and large, uh, courts in uh, European political systems are not as independent as they are in the American system, and they don't have a, a, as strong a tradition of judicial review, uh, and therefore the judges are not as aggressive in pushing back against government agencies. And the key point that I want you to take away here is that even though European welfare states are not immune to adopting and scaling non-evidence-based practices, they do have stronger corrective mechanisms for when things go wrong. Which leads me to the American experience. Um, first clinic in the United States opens in 2007. Similar to Europe, we see, then see a sharp and sudden increase in referrals, new patient profile. And at this point, the med US medical associations start to get involved. WPATH in 2012 with its SOC 7, Endocrine Society gu Clinical Practice Guidelines in 2017, AAP Policy Statement in 2018. Um, then you start to see growing criticisms alongside a growing industry. Right, so now we have over 100 gender clinics in the United States. Um, and in, in a very short period of time, this becomes one of the most polarizing uh, uh, issues of American politics. So we see kind of an intense politicization and polarization where Republicans support total ban on these, uh, on these interventions for minors and Democrats think that there's absolutely nothing wrong with them and want them to, to be uh, made more accessible. So now we're kind of left with the situation of all or nothing. These are the two political choices that we have. Either ban it all or scale it up. So why do we in the United States lack the corrective mechanisms that the Europeans have? Um, and it has a lot to do with the exceptional American state. So let me briefly mention what I mean by that, and I don't want to be too political science-y here, but, but this stuff is important. That's not my alarm, by the way. Um, our welfare state in the United States developed late and haphazardly compared to the European experience. Um, so, you know, our welfare state developed pretty much exclusively in the 20th century, um, and it was in fits and starts. So, New Deal, Social Security, a few, uh, you know, regulatory agencies, 1960s, the Great Society, Medicaid and Medicare, and so on and so forth, and of course, the Obama era, you get the Affordable Care Act, huge expansion in the uh, uh, regulatory uh, power of government over health care. Um, so it comes in waves, right? And it's not coordinated, it's not always organized. Um, but no less important is that the United States uh, welfare state is uh, uh, attacked on to these constitutional structures and norms that endure despite changes. So for example, high degree of decentralization, separation of powers, and federalism. That shapes the way in which we do medicine. Um, judicial independence and judicial review. The courts play a huge role in defining what counts as health care, who should get it, who should pay, what, where, why, and when. Um, and of course, a highly politicized bureaucracy. Every incoming president gets to appoint around 4,000 bureaucrats to the federal uh, uh, government, the executive branch. Um, so our, our bureaucracy by design is very political compared to the European model, which is you know, re heavily reliant on civil service and career uh, civil service uh, personnel. Um, and that too is by design because we don't trust bureaucrats. We don't trust centralized authority. And this leads to political culture. As I said, there's a kind of a strong impulse in American uh, political culture going all the way back to our founding uh, of distrust of centralized authority and expertise. Um, there's a high degree of individualism in our culture uh, and rights talk, individual rights talk. That's a term from uh, Marianne Glendon's book. Um, and that means that when we want to say, I want something or group X should get something, we frame those arguments in the language of individual rights. Whereas Europeans might say something like, the government should allocate more resources to scientific research or, uh, of cancer or to helping people with ALS. Um, in the American experience, we'll say things like, um, people with ALS have the right to healthcare. They have the right to certain kinds of treatments and certain kinds of policies. Um, and that, of course, it lends itself, again, to, uh, to the judicial branch, to the courts, because that's where these uh, definitions of rights are, are battled over. 
Um, and then finally, a, a feature of the American state is uh, what a political scientist Suzanne Mettler calls the submerged state. And this just refers to the way in which a lot of our welfare policies are done, not through direct government programs and government spending, um, but through these kind of backdoor policies like home mortgage interest deductions, student loan programs, whereas in Europe you would see like, you know, free college. Um, here we have, you know, the government underwriting risky bank loans to students and so on and so forth. That's how we do welfare policy. What, what is the relevance of this for American medicine? Well, first of all, we don't have universal health insurance. That's obvious. We have a mix of public and private payers and providers dizzying complex mix that very few people really understand. Um, American medicine is heavily regulated, but largely through the submerged state. Obamacare is a very good example of that. Um, uh, profit motive is a very important force in American healthcare, unlike in Europe. Um, no centralized authority with the power to set standards. Uh, we do have a patchwork of agencies at the federal level, like the FDA, Center for Medicaid and, uh, uh, and, and Medicare, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. But these, organiz these agencies are, by and large, unable to do what the European, uh, uh, you know, let's say Finland's cohere has been able to do. They lack the resources, they lack the authority, um, and they certainly kind of constantly, even if they had the willpower, they would run up against, for example, the federal courts. And this diffusion of responsibility for medical policy means that um, there's just less responsibility, less accountability in the system for when things go wrong. And a, a big part of why that happens is, again, the civil rights state. And so very briefly on medical associations and gender clinicians. You know, in, in the United States, medical groups like the American Academy of Pediatrics play an outsized role in, in shaping medical policy. Um, uh, and that, again, happens with the background of uh, the absence of centralized, bureaucratized, top-down authority, uh, health uh, healthcare quality regulation. Um, de facto, the medical associations control policy, control practice, especially when things get to the courts. Judge, a judge is a lawyer, doesn't know anything about medicine or science. When he sees the entire medical establishment telling him that gender-affirming care is settled science and life-saving, um, and the judge doesn't have time to second guess their opinion or the inclination, uh, most reasonable judges would defer. Um, and of course, gender clinicians in our system of government, um, uh, uh, in our, sorry, in our medical system, um, uh, much more than in Europe, have strong incentives, strong pressures to boost, the, to create their own reputations and, and to pursue their own careers and, and, and gain uh, fame and, and, and prestige and uh, uh, prestigious appointments, and yes, also money. Um, I don't have time to get into this, but this is an example from uh, arthroscopic surgery, um, how it became a routine treatment with hundreds of thousands of cases every year. Um, and when a randomized control treatment, um, uh, randomized control trial came out in 2002 showing that actually these arthroscopic knee surgeries are no better than placebo, a sham surgery. Um, meaning they're unnecessary um, and expensive and risky. Um, it was the medical associations of surgeons who lobbied uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid to narrow the interpretation of that randomized control trial so that they could continue doing operations which are extremely lucrative for surgeons. So that's one example uh, of how medical associations are first and foremost trade groups, trade unions that represent the interests of their members and only secondarily um, scientific institutions. And so just to kind of uh, very quickly, examples of the civil rights state in medicine, um, groups like the AAP, the Endocrine Society, have kind of carved on their mission statement a commitment to social justice. This took off especially in the era of uh, George Floyd and COVID. Um, and they've committed themselves to the view that anybody who pushes back or even is skeptical of gender medicine is a bigot. Um, once they've taken this position, it's very difficult for them to, to, to go back from it. Um, another example, again, don't have time to get into it, but the Affordable Care Act has uh, Section 1557. It imports Title IX into, uh, uh, into health care, uh, which says no discrimination on the basis of sex in health care. Um, the Obama administration issued a rule that said sex means gender identity, and ever since, that has created very strong incentives for uh, public and private insurers uh, to cover gender transition treatments, uh, lest they run afoul of the civil rights state. And then the third example um, is, 
in the failure, uh, in the context of the failure of medical groups to regulate themselves, um, states pass laws, blue states pass uh, uh, sanctuary state laws, courts get involved, and this becomes a legal political battle instead of a scientific one. So the takeaway points very quickly. Um, in the United States, gender transition is treated as a, as a civil rights issue with medical and mental health implications. Um, okay. Um, uh, so it's treated as a civil rights issue with medical and mental health implications, and I've been trying to argue that we should start treating it as a medical and mental health issue with civil rights implications. That reversal is absolutely crucial. A reversal in people's minds, but it also has concrete policy consequences um, in education and in, in medicine. Number two, like medicine more broadly, gender medicine in the United States will always be politicized. It, this is not just because it touches on you know, these kind of core cultural ideas of the human person, but also because of the unique nature of, American, of the American state, as I've been explaining. Um, I think we can and should work to depolarize gender medicine but I think that the idea that we can depoliticize it, we could take it entirely out of the political sphere is naive. Um, we have no choice given our political system but to work within it and uh, to involve the parties and engage the Democratic Party and try to moderate its position. And then number three, we also have no choice but to work within the constraints of the exceptional state, American state. For example, if schools are adopting radical policies due to legal uncertainty, we can do one of two things. We can either try to push for more certainty and clarity on the legal rules, or we can create alternatives to these uh, advocacy organizations that hover around schools and threaten to sue them, but only advancing our work, maybe even advancing uh, the new gender framework. Thank you.